So we're waiting for the cars to roll out here. And again, uh, about a minute and 38, 39 seconds for our top guys. Probably about a minute and 41, 42 for our, the guys at the bottom half of the top 10 here. We'll see what they can do. The track conditions are, uh, well, I was going to joke it's a little slick out there, but, but it's, it's actually yeah. pretty grippy considering the temperature that we've got. And it's, it's cloudy, uh, and it should be ideal for running pretty quick laps. Now, well, go ahead. Tom. I was, I was going to make the point, this is the first time that these drivers aren't looking at the sky with grid closing in two minutes going, what the heck do I do? This is this is the first time for these drivers, including all the practice, including and quali uh, qualify everything uh, other than actual qualifying that these guys are just like put your drives on and go drive a lap well uh, so they're probably all relieved for that absolutely and, and going back to some engine swaps the for, uh, fifth, fourth, fifth car in that line was uh, a Scion FRS. That and en that engine in there is actually from an S2000. Uh, oh, they, cool. They're kind of calling it AP1 or AP2. Uh, don't know off the top. AP1. It's AP1. Yeah. Yeah. Cool ones. So all right, there's a nine thousand RPM. Yeah, there's our house rolling on the racetrack. This is a two point five Ecotech swap. This is a Ford Fusion motor, basically. How do you stagger the starts? Like, uh, are we starting and finishing at the start line so they get to kind of warm up until yep. they get to that point? Yeah. So what we're going to see is each car go out for a warm up lap, and then once they start their flying lap, the next car will be released for a warm up. Oh, cool. The car on the track will finish his flying lap and start a cool down. The car from behind will start a flyer, and then they'll release the next car. So there will be up to three cars on track at one time. They will be all spread out, but there will always be one car warming up one car on a flyer and one car on a cooldown. Right now we're looking at Eric Meadows who finished 10th in yesterday's race. This is probably the mildest car in the top 10. You can see there's not a lot of aero, no aero at all. Um, but fundamentally underneath he does have the good shocks, the good wheels and tires, the good engine power to weight ratio. So he's more or less uh, still a, a fully built GLTC car. You can see little flashes of stickers on the tires. So he decided to throw a fresh set of Hoosiers on this car uh, and he will be going for uh, a flyer here in just a couple minutes. So this becomes very intense as soon as they take the green flag. This is every driver focusing because you do not get a chance to make this up. If you blow turn one, it's over. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of a, of a need to maybe underdrive just a little bit, just so that you don't make a huge mistake. However, if you do that, you're going to be slow. For me... That doesn't. Uh, that's not the case for Eric because sure. he can't do any worse than tenth. He's already that's, tenth. The right. worst case, he's where he starts. Right. Whatever. So go, go out there and, and go for it. Yeah, or in a go. ditch. But you know, hopefully you know, <laughs> he's already actually he lost an engine here earlier this year and put a whole bunch of other cars in a ditch because he <laughs> lost yeah, the he, oil he everywhere else. Yeah, but I mean that's uh, that's cool though because it kind of relates a little bit more to my world in, in the drifting competition world because you really do at the end of the day get one run or one set of runs at least yeah. follow to really prove. You're worth that weekend. Green flag for Eric Meadows down into turn number one. Going to tuck it in nice and tight. Maybe a little bit of early apex wobbling there. The track got a little bit of dirt on it. Now through turn number two. Get the car downshifted. Probably second gear here. Maybe third. Now he'll accelerate up out. Get that car squatting on power time and head to turn three. Down into turn three. And one thing we should mention, drift obviously just wrapped up. There's probably some dirt and debris, which we saw kick up at the apex of turn number one. So the track conditions Sorry. theoretically may get better and better. It's not a bad thing. It's just part of the reality <laughs> of it. you got to deal with the track conditions. So Eric Meadows now smooth to turn number three. Don't see any any major mistakes looks pretty good so far and again he's really got nothing to lose here other than uh you know putting it off into a ditch we're going to see uh, ryan upham rolling off the pit lane to start his warm-up lap so when you see the black and red bmw he's warming up but all eyes on the silver nc mx5 coming towards us at turn number seven this is the trickiest part when i drove earlier today this is the part that i struggled with the most turn seven get that car to the right oh this, this is going to track all the way out to the edge of the racetrack now now keep rolling through turn eight and then back to the left of turn nine that's the transition that's so hard and he was deep into turn seven totally missed the apex so a, a first mistake we've seen out of meadows but he's now rallied that one and now headed towards turn number 10 this car probably peaking just over 100 miles an hour when he now gets on the binders all the way off to the left side to open up the entry to that corner you can see from this angle just how much the track drops away now a really late apex and the car starts to unwind the wheel accelerate up towards turn number 10 this is the only time on the track that you really have a break as a driver you get to think about what you've done and now you get to focus towards turn number 11 just cresting about 120 miles an hour in a gltc car as he gets on the binders at about the two mark there hard brakes and into the apex for the turn number 11 beautiful carrying speed all the way out to the edge of the track, and this will be our first lap time of GLCT, GLTC Top 10 Shootout. Across the line for Eric Meadows. What will he run? How about a 146-333? I don't think he'll be thrilled with that. Uh, so, unfortunately, that was not quite where we thought he would be running. Could be down to turn one. We saw him make a slight mistake there, then over in turn seven, Tom. Missing one apex is going to cost you a lot of time. For Eric Meadows, he was going to start 10th anyway. For everybody else, ooh, boy, you better clean it up because you want to you want to qualify well here, Tom, because we've seen starting up front at least keeps you ahead of all the chaos that we're going to see behind. True. And the, the Hoosier R7 does take a little bit of time to come up to temperature. These cars will get faster and faster over the lap. So we've seen fast laps and track records down in the 138 range. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't really see anybody go much sub-140 uh, or at all sub-140 
party, uh, which means we have to shun them all and not talk to them ever again. <laughs> that is interesting, though, he said about, uh, you know, he can lose so much time off of a little mistake because that is kind of like the light car, low power thing is they're less forgiving because bigger car, bigger power, you know, a slight mistake won't necessarily cost you as much because little car, you have to get back up to speed, right? Exactly. Well, the Ryan, bigger cars uh, recover better. Yeah, well, Ryan Upham's M3, this car has been really good at Road America. Almost won the final race of the weekend. This car is a rocket ship, too. So as he gets it tucked into turn number two, uh, he should be able to power that car off, see a little bit of counter steer all the way out to the edge of the racetrack using every inch, Tom. This M3 has been a really good uh, kind of uh, kind of build that they've been working on they, they've got there's kind of a, a car very built very similar to it that's 802 woody hyman they look very similar from a distance but uh ryan up i'm so close to victory at road america i think he'd love to put it on pole and go for one today yeah the car looked a little pushy in turn numbers turn numbers one and two a little twitchy as well and now he's tucking it down into turn number five goes for the double apex approach rather than swinging wide there again he's a little bit early and you see him we washed out uh so it looks like either the track conditions or or the tire temperatures it is very cool here uh look at that big push you Whoa. see a ton of steering lock and the car just won't turn he's really struggling to get the bmw to handle and that may be why we saw eric meadows time so far off what we expected i don't know that we're going to see ryan upham do much better yeah, maybe uh, the track is just not as fast as we expected it to be tom and, and also remember you, you said warm-up lap maybe these drivers on pit lane should be thinking maybe i should get my tires as warm as possible for my flying lap maybe they went out there thinking it would be fine and they discovered very quickly oh my tires are still cold yep What's the burnout rule? Can you have like a burnout box? I don't, I don't think what? Adam would be very happy. No one's thought about that yet, actually. No. I think we should go try that. But now time. we're on the PA. Everyone's going to go try it it's now. <laughs> we're going to get in trouble. <laughs> That's an autocross thing. You want to be a dork about doing a burnout <laughs> at your autocross, warming the tires. Down into turn number 11. Now on the brakes. This car is so good on the brakes. I heard Eric Cattell tell me all these M3s, all these BMWs in general, are so good on the binders. Now across the line for Ryan Upham. Where will he line up for GLTC race number three? Across the line, 141.792. Pretty decent lap, I would say. That that's uh, that's going to be probably top seven or six. Yeah, uh, better better than expected to be honest. We saw the, how pushy that car looked early in the lap, but uh, it must have come back to him, and, and he did a much better job uh, salvaging mistakes maybe than Eric Meadows was able to. So the next car we'll see was our eighth place finisher from yesterday's race, Emil Tab, who will be certainly a contender. Again, these drivers uh, were working off of a wet race, and Tab is one of the contenders at the top uh, every time uh, that we get one of these more normal races. So uh, I would expect to see him. He's one of the drivers that has a big opportunity to pick up positions uh, from eighth place yesterday. Emil Tab's car is an absolute demon in the straight line. At Road America, he was giving people slam drafts on the straightaways. That's Whoa, oh. lock up. Down into turn number one, and Emil Tab is off all the way out to the porta potty there on track out. And is this the Hoosiers not being warmed up? And uh, it's just like it could be. This yeah. car I don't think has ABS. Well, time. yeah, this is the first car that doesn't have ABS, and there you you talk about the high stakes. The first corner, first mistake, and the lap's gone. So Emil Tab will likely be our tenth place starter based on that mistake, Ugh. unless anybody else is able to <laughs> to or doesn't get a lap in as well. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is, is he carries so much straightaway speed, and it's so easy to lock up tires. We, we had a big ABS versus non-ABS discussion at Road America because it was wet there for a couple races, and in the wet, the ABS becomes a huge advantage. Talked to yeah. Perez Randilia, and he was like, yeah, I, I can get in so much deeper than some of these people around me. So Emil Tab, just the slightest mistake off into turn one. I don't. I just think you're right, Tom. I don't think the track has the grip that we expected it to have. But I think, I mean, if you're Emil, keep going. If someone else makes a mistake, you want to have a faster mistake lap than everybody else's mistake <laughs> lap. So uh, you can see he's still on it, and he can get the tires up to temperature, get a sense for what the track conditions are going to be. These guys are racing in just over an hour, so there's no reason to give up and, uh, and necessarily never quit in racing. Absolutely not. So Emil Tab will work through 7, 8, and 9 now and recover. And while that was a, a big oopsie, it's always a possibility <laughs> that someone else will make another mistake. So it's Honestly, it's not a whole lot. I still think these drivers that were down in 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th, there's not a lot to lose. You go one, sure. one, one row back, yeah. so you know he'll well, start... Yeah. Wor worst case, he starts tenth instead of eighth. That's like one more car to pass at the start. I think if you're even if you're on the front row, I still think that you're at risk of being put three wide into turn one. We saw that yesterday. I don't think there's really anywhere that's safe. I think you're just a little bit safer if you're in the top four or top three, just because you get a little bit more breathing room and uh, you can at least see. Oh, he didn't. Where even, you're going. He didn't finish his lap, so he yep. uh, he's guaranteeing himself a, a tenth place start now, which means we all eyes shift to Ryan Kristoff, which is Ooh. the coolest car in the top ten, in yes. my opinion. This is actually a GLTC exhibition car because it is semi tube frame, uh, which is not allowed in the rule books. That's one of the things we don't 
don't allow, but this car is built for SECA club racing and makes speed exactly the same way that a GLTC car does. And Ryan is uh, a, a grid life buddy from years and years and years and years. He's got this car and we bring it out. Uh, he brings it out to race whenever he can. So uh, front wheel drive, semi tube frame, Honda CRX from 1986, I believe, starting his flyer. This was Ryan Kristoff, seventh place finisher from race two yesterday. New transmission in this car uh, blew it up at Road America a couple weeks ago. They, they put a new one in and they're back and ready to race now. Again, this car looks like what a TCR would, car would look like in 1986. Down into turn one, a little bit off the apex there, but I don't think Ryan Kristoff usually takes a lot of curbing. He's generally pretty respectful about the edges of the racetrack between the white lines. So uh, this car handles so well. I mean, it's just such a lightweight short wheelbase platform it, it'll be a rocket ship here i think with ryan in the car it's about 1800 pounds as he's now oh a big lock up that's the rear tire number three that was uh i think that was the left the right front was it the right front it looked like it could have been a right rear i saw a video uh, of him at indianapolis a couple of years ago he had locked up rear tires on the entry to uh the infield complex in the infield of indy turn one so uh he has locked up rear tires before but that just goes to show you how on the limit he is here Working his way through turn five and six. This is, again, the lightest car, which means it's the hardest to put temps in. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to keep this thing spun up. He's grabbing gears, super short gear ratios, uses first, second, third. Whoa, fifth, big rear lock up again. Oh, oh, no, off Huge the racetrack. Oh. And Kristoff going to go way off into the weeds. Uh, turn number seven. And like I said, I think just the, does he have a brake bias adjustment in this car? He shot? should, but I'm just yeah. blown away at how hard the conditions must be right now. We don't see these kinds of mistakes out of GLTC front Especially runners. not at a Kristoff. I think I mean, that no. track is deceptively cold, though. Yeah, I think so. And, I and, totally agree. And I think the Kristoff, again, so going into three, that must have been a rear tire. I think maybe, again, you had this issue. You drove TCR cars for a couple of years. On the opening laps of a race, it is a big problem in, in these cars to get rear tire temp. And especially when you're on the brakes hard, you're going to be locking up those rear tires. They'll be sliding around on you. It's so easy for that to let go. But Kristoff did a great job getting it stopped before he got now, into it. We'll lead. see if he doesn't quit. He will actually get to start ninth in front of Emil Tab. Uh, I don't know that. Christoph knows Emil didn't finish his flyer. So if he realizes that, uh, he has the opportunity to still not start in the, in the 10th position. But we shift focus now to that uh, F20-powered uh, Scion FRS, Justin Kelly. Yeah, Justin Kelly, they, they were working on this car a bunch. Uh, debuted last year at Road America. And since then, he's gotten a couple victories, uh, most recently uh, at Pikes Peak International Raceway in Colorado. Uh, and uh, Miri Motorsports, they bring out a whole bunch of cars. They've got Tiffany Kelly in a similar-looking S2000, which has an S2000 motor in it. Uh, she just had a clutch or a throwout bearing put in it the other day uh, so she was working on that but uh, Justin and Tiffany husband and wife combination as they head down into turn number 11 to start his lap Tom and we'll see what Justin can get out of it we know that Justin's super aggressive especially on race starts and I think he's right in his element here I think he might have done the burnout he I don't know if he's <laughs> listening or not but I heard a whole lot of racket yeah. on the right side <laughs> of our announced vehicle he's starting his flyer was the sixth place finisher from yesterday's race current provisional pole is Ryan Upham at a 141.7 and Kelly now oh. grabbing a bunch of curb through turn number two packs her up and sends it down into turn number two a little shallow a big slide he's getting after it right now we saw that car moving around through turn number one all the way out to the edge of the racetrack now slamming through the gears to get down into uh, turn three here and i think what we're going to see people gain or lose time is through that 789 complex that is so challenging that's what's been uh, tricky that's where eric meadows made his mistake and where christoph had his spin he's really? looking and sounding fast though compared to the guys previous yeah, really getting after it. And, and Justin, on the, the starts of races, he certainly uh, has, has been known to go three wide. He's not afraid to go four wide. He'll take it eight wide if you want to. Uh, but through turn six now, tucks it in nice and tight. And here's the tricky part, turn seven, eight, nine. Yeah, this was the section that seemed to have uh, a lot of debris and also a lot of uh, – it just doesn't have a lot of temp in it, I don't think. And he's looking the most composed for sure out of all the drivers we've seen come through. Now into turn number eight, you're going to see a fast transition. Does he break? Yes, just a little bit, but you can see he's oh. still offline. Yep. Uh, he wasn't able to get the car tucked in for turn number eight, and then transitioning back to turn nine, he was in that debris. And again, it's not necessarily because the debris is online. It's probably because it's cold online, which is putting them offline and putting them into debris. Yep. And it's this <laughs> exacerbating, you know, the, the, the snake eating its own head or whatever. <laughs> eating its own head? Tail? Whatever. The Ouroboros. Yes, that. Now up the straightaway now, getting through the gears again. This S2000 power plant, this has been sort of an interesting uh, build because Pervez Randilia has the FA20 that this car comes with in it. It's been interesting because they've been very close to each other. So swapping this car didn't really seem to do a whole lot for the straightaway pace. But now at a turn 11, we'll come across the line. Right now, the time to beat the 141, 792. Can Justin Kelly beat it across the line? Justin Kelly in the Myriad Motorsports 86, second place of 143, 149. 
So I guess not faster. He just was making a lot of engine noise. Yes. <laughs> well, that, th this is also one. I think one of the loudest cars. Yeah. The, grid. the Honda engine way. Yeah, I could feel. I could feel that big Honda. Yeah. Coming through the uh, walls of the, the announcer's studio here. Speaking of Hondas, the next car, Brandon Puck has a Honda engine in it as well. That's a K24 powered NA Miata. So that red Miata working his way towards uh, turn number ten, probably about now, uh, was fifth place finisher yesterday, and he's the the f unfamiliar face in the top ten. We haven't seen much of him his new car for Road America. I uh, was able to meet him and talk to him last night. He actually was racing Porsches and SECA for a little while, uh, was tired of how broken that car was all the time, and decided I'm going to go uh, the answer to all questions, Miata, but I'm going to put a Honda engine in, and he's starting flyer lap number one for the shootout top ten. Down into turn number one, and again, you mentioned it, fresh face. Every time you come to GLTC, it's just about earning your respect of your fellow competitors, and Brennan Puck has done just that through turn one, getting after it now into turn two. Bit of a slide on entry. You can watch those front tires working here, Tom, as he gets through two. It looks good so far. You can see just how much more track he's using than Justin Kelly, who was looking tight and tidy, but was just pretty shallow on everything. Puck now hard on the brakes. The nose dives down and see how much wider he is than Kelly was. He's setting up for the long run down to turn number five, and this is a huge straightaway in a GLTC car. It goes away fast in a time attack car, but this is a lot of watt in a little K24 Miata headed down towards the braking zone for turn number five, and we'll see the roof of that Miata pop Whoop, into frame there just there. Oh, that was, uh, what, what was What was that? Where'd he go? We lost him. <laughs> he he comes might up. have shot off the track. Didn't he? No, there he is. Oh, okay. Ooh, we were, thank God. <laughs> there was a lot more track to the left of yes. frame than we realized. So now down towards turn number seven. This is where cars have been pushing wide. He's still pretty far off the apex there, but looking composed. Will he be able to tuck it in for turn number eight? This is a great platform. We've seen the winning formula cars really get after it. Look at that. That was a really good line through here. Now we'll throttle back up all the way out to the edge of the racetrack and tuck it in for 9 into 10B. This is a really weird braking zone because you're still kind of coming out of 9. Then you got to slam to the brakes and you're kind of moving your way to the edge of the track. And then the track completely falls away from you through 10B, Tom. So it can be tricky to find the right line through there. It's a high-risk, high-reward kind of corner because, again, you're breaking downhill and you can just shoot off on the field. But uh, he gets it tucked into turn number 10 and Heavily down the straightaway now towards the braking zone for turn number 11. Here he is, breaking about the two marker on the binders and to the apex. The two marker, man, I was breaking early. As they come out of turn number 11, all the way out using the curbing that's out there across the start finish line. Brandon Puck, the new guy in GLTC. What will he run as he comes across the line? Second place, 142, 689, splitting Kelly and Upham. He is right now provisionally on the front row. And I got to, I, I got to feel like I owe an apology to Ryan up and we didn't really talk we, much <laughs> we didn't talk well of his lap but no. it's clearly a fast lap and everyone else they had we such different saying. lines too yeah, yeah that, the Miata was just taking up so much of a more of the track when he was coming in all right so here is the heavy hitter this is Aaron Lichty he's won over 25 races in his Gridlife Touring Cup career uh, his top five ratio is unbelievable basically Aaron Lichty will finish top five or he won't finish at all and he's only not finished two or three times in his entire career so Aaron is, is pretty much the gold standard for GLTC builds and drivers he's really good the rain has not been kind to him. The tricky surface has been a little bit weird for him this weekend. Uh, but I think this is going to be a time for him to get his starting position to go out and win race number three. We'll see what he's got here. And he's warming the tires up pretty significantly. He's down the back straight. You don't really need to go down the back straight at speed on your warm-up lap because you're coming into turn 11. As long as you get a good run off of 11, that's where the flyer comes in. So this is an almost identical car to uh, Brandon Puck's car. Again, another Honda motor in this car built out of the same shop. Aaron, Aaron uh, is the winning formula uh, owner, so uh, he's kind of the brainchild behind all this starting his flyer green flag for Aaron Lichty into turn number one and nicely done so far grabs a little bit of the curb with the left look at the hands you got he's got white gloves so you can really watch his hands get after it way huge push fast into turn number two you can see him still work at the car as he comes through two all the way out to the edge of the racetrack but he had to fight understeer there at the beginning of the corner yeah, you can see his hands just kind of locked into place and he didn't move him at all which means he was just waiting on the front end to respond he's running a very similar line to Brandon Puck uh, so I think uh, these drivers kind of know what the cars need to do all the way out to the grass there's a ton of grip on that concrete curb if you know to trust to track the car out there as now he comes down to turn number five this is where we thought puck went off uh, <laughs> and we get the mystery again for lichty there he is he looks pretty good so the other thing about aaron lichty's car is this car is super old i think it's it, well, it's older than me for sure but he's had this car forever it's been raced it's been raced and changed and it's, it's been a race car forever is what oh, you mean. Oh, a big lock lock up. Up. oh he's got that right front tire he managed to carry it and get it unlocked but oh, that, he man. carried that for about a hundred years so much understeer though that's, yeah. that's a bummer i don't yeah. know what's going on back in turn seven but it is catching everybody out no brakes that time he's looked how much more confident he was to just toss toss the car through turns eight and 
and nine all the way out to the grass into turn number 10. Can that mistake still produce a 141.7 or well, better? That's yeah, what's pole time. You have to worry about flat spots, too. If he goes down to an 11 really fast, he dragged that tire for about 100 feet. That could work a flat spot into it. And every time you get on the brakes, it will catch, 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 catch on that flat spot, and it'll get hung up again. No ABS in this car either. Now into turn number 11. High speeds here, about 100, 120 to 125 miles an hour for Lichty. On the brakes, down a couple gears, get through turn number 11 and throttle up for the straightaway. Checkered flag for Lichty, winning his driver in GLTC. Where will he line up on the grid so far in GLTC? Top 10 shootout across the line. And will he go purple? No, P2, 141.8, so a tenth, no, not even a tenth, two hundredths off of Ryan Upham wow. for the front row. He, Aaron Lichty will do no better than second place. Ryan Upham still holding down that phenomenal pole time, but a very similar car now warming up for his flyer. This is Woody Hyman uh, in a very similar BMW E36. Uh, Hyman runs a smaller wheel and tire package. It's built with a little bit more aero and a little bit less power in mind, uh, so you can see the cars will look slightly different, but still uh, a torquey BMW coming in. He was the third place finisher from yesterday. So I've heard, uh, Little Birdie has told me, that, that often weaving in itself doesn't really create a lot of heat, but this longitudinal braking and accelerating seems to kind of do that better. So uh, it, it, you see weaving a lot to clean off tires. So how much is that helping Woody Hyman right now preparing this, these tires for this? I, I saw stickers on those tires. So if they're brand new, you definitely want to weave around and scuff in the entire surface because if you're just accelerating and braking, there's a whole bunch of that outside tire that with the camber, you're not actually scuffing in. Yeah. So a good combination of both is important, but it's that acceleration and braking that gets the core of the tire up to temperature. If you're weaving around you're getting the surface up to temp, but you really want to get the entire car, or the real, the entire carcass of the tire warmed up as much as you possibly can on these warm-up laps. So you can see that combination as he's now through turn number 11 onto that front straightaway. I think that was pretty good call. Headlights ablaze starting his green flag lap for the shootout. Woody Hyman has been an exceptional driver. He joined GLTC this year, and every time we go to a racetrack, he's consistently surprised me with how man he's managed to get through starts and, and, and claw his way to the front. Mid-Ohio sports car course ran really well in tricky conditions, but so far so good. A little bit of oversteer here as he comes out of turn Yeah, two. busy hands, and he was way shallower in turn two than of the previous couple of drivers. You can see he was car widths inside uh, entering turn number two, but uh, oh. deep into turn three, that's going to have to pivot it down to the late apex. I think he might have missed that one just a bit, but again, Again, it's turn seven that is catching everybody else. I think if you can get through turn seven quick, uh, even Ryan Upham had that huge push through there. I think that's the make or break spot on these shootout laps right now. So the big question is turn number seven. That's what's been catching everybody out. Can uh, Woody Hyman get through here better than everybody else did? And right now it's about a 200th gap from Lichty to Upham. I'm, I'm curious. It's going to be really difficult for Hyman to slot in between those two cars, but nice line through seven. Gets the car out. A little bit of understeer there, but now he'll get it tucked in for eight. That was really really well done there. Yeah, that was mo one of the most composed we've seen. Chucks it back and forth through turns eight and nine. But again, Kelly looked really composed, and he just didn't have the pace. So it's going to be a question mark as we uh, don't have sector times or anything else to reference, but what it looks like from the TV screens Hyman deep on the brakes into turn number 10, falls away from him, and he's really wide again, so he might have overshot the entry yeah. to turn number 10. Uh, doesn't necessarily make or break the lap uh, entirely, but if he could keep his speed up and get a good run down this back straightaway, that is what counts the most. Yeah, I think you know you make a mistake that costs you a tenth a lap here. That's 1.1 seconds worth of time lost. So down into turn number 11, can Hyman overcome the slight mistakes that he had earlier in the lap out of turn number 11? Now to the line, getting through the gears. Where will Woody Hyman line up? He has to beat a one. 41, 792, and Hyman goes third with a 141, 836, only Man. two hundredths behind Aaron Lichty. Yeah, that means four less than a half a tenth of a second across the top three right now. Up on Lichty and Hyman, two BMWs and a K Miata. Uh, now we look to Eric Cotille, the only oh. other front wheel drive car in the shootout. And front wheel drive cars do a better job of getting tires up to temp than rear wheel drive cars because they're exerting so much force through those two drive tires. Eric has the job of getting the rear tires warm enough that he can hang on to this thing for this flyer. Eric Attil is the second winningest driver in Grid Live Touring Cup, most recently winning at Road America. Uh, in his car, I think it, it benefits from having a little bit of straightaway as well. I, I think he struggled at PPIR. There wasn't enough room, and it was a, just not a great racetrack for this chassis. But through turn number 11, Cotill is uh, is a super good driver. He competes 
in day in and day out with Aaron Lichty and across the line, he's going to go for it here. I think Cotill might be your pole sitter if he can get this done cleanly. He's feeling confident about the pace of this car at this track, and you see dirt flying. <laughs> he's cutting all the distance out now, shoots all the way out to the outside to get this car rotated into turn number two as early as possible. The front-wheel drive cars, you got to get the nose pointed to the straightaway early, and he does so. Looks nice and clean all the way up. Checks the brakes. Uh, that gives you a lot of confidence if you don't have boosted brakes and no ABS. You want a good bite, so you check that pedal with your left foot. You see a little bit of pogoing going into turn number three, but dirt again at the apex trying to cut as much distance off this track and again our polls our winner from yesterday is not driving in the race today so that yellow s2000 you're going to watch warm up has a different driver today this may be our last serious podium contender unless ronnie solomon finds serious pace out of that s2000 Coutille dirt again at the apex of turn number six wow. what does turn seven do sure, this is what's been catching everyone off guard here Coutille down into turn number seven can he get the car rotated in hucks it in nicely hits the apex kona tracks all the way out to the edge of the racetrack looks good there tom looks fast. Good. little bit of fire out of the back of that car too. Dirt again at the oh, apex. Perfect. A little behind going into turn number nine. A uh, little bit straight through there, but uh, keeps it on the track, tracking out of turn number nine. I thought it was good. <laughs> Down into 10B. And, and he's going to get on the binders now and tuck it in and accelerate off. And Cotill, if he were to nab pole, he'd have to beat a 141, 792. This looks like a, a, an amazing lap so far here, Tom. We'll see if he can wrap it up. Look at him even apexing a little bit of a yeah. kink coming up the hill. And again, these cars have gone 138s here this weekend. So there's a huge amount of time under that pole time. It's just a matter of whether or not the track will give it to him right now and whether he can grab it. He's turned in now for turn number 11. All the way down to the grass, this lap has looked really good. Is it a 141? Is it a 140? Question marks across the line for Eric Coutille, and it is yeah. pole. 140.6. Eric Coutille wow. takes the top spot. Yeah, he just uh, might drop that by. That was over a second that he grabbed the pole by. Uh, so that's provisional pole for Eric Coutille, and that was a really well done lap, super composed, using all of the racetrack. That was what was important. And uh, now the goal focuses to Ron Solomon, who uh, is that how you say that name? Yeah, uh, Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie Solomon. Solomon. So he's part of the uh, the Andy Smedgard Motors ASM uh, RS Motors community. Those guys up out of, uh, I believe, the uh, uh, Wisconsin area uh, come down. So that uh, is a K-powered S2000, the yellow car, warming up down the back straight probably right about now. And uh, Andy Smedgard was able to go from uh, outside the top 20 to win yesterday's rain race. He's starting his flyer now. Ronnie's hopping into this car with not a lot of information, oh. but he's pushing it hard. Grabs a bunch of dirt at the apex of turn number one. You see just how shallow he is coming into turn number two, which doesn't do him any favors getting the car turned in. Uh, but he is still going to make the corner easily and tack her up down the straightaway. So remember, as long as he finishes his lap, he'll be seventh. Because yeah. we had three cars that, that had offs or didn't complete, a, or actually make that eighth. Uh, Emil Tab and Kristoff had issues. So all he's got to do is just run a clean lap. He'll be P8 at worst. So go after it. I mean, again, the worst you're going to do is tenth, even if you loop it. Pretty sure uh, he, he qualified this car yesterday in similar conditions, and I'm pretty sure his fastest lap was a 43 or a 44. Uh, so he does have the opportunity to also bump Eric Meadows. Uh, the, the, the thing for me is he hasn't been in this car for you know, 24 hours. He's just got to be able to hop in and deliver in, in one lap. That's really hard. Uh, but we know the car's got the pace in it. He does have ABS, so I don't expect to see nearly the issues we've seen out of the last couple cars coming through turn seven. As you can see, he easily makes that braking zone. Uh, and that ABS is definitely, I mean, as, as a driver, uh, you know, someone who's made a living as a driver, the only driver aid I ever want is ABS. I always want ABS if I can have it. Uh, and that's, it's good for, for these drivers to have that as well. He can have way more confidence, even on cold tires, tricky conditions, to shove that car down into the corner uh, and Whoa. break late. A little wide into 10B. He's off the apex or just by a touch, but waited a long time to turn in. The track falls away, hey, Tom. Look good to me, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> As they come up, they'll, hey, I shouldn't be saying anything. You're the other driver that's won at Daytona and Sebring. I have not done that. I spun on pit exit today. You, you did do that. <laughs> Is it just driver preference if they want ABS or not? Uh, it's a lot of down to the platform. So the yeah. S2000 obviously comes with ABS. Right. The old Miatas and Civics didn't. Uh, so uh, you just kind of inherit it. Mm -hmm. And no one's took taking the time to add it. But now with Ronnie Solomon cutting that distance straight to the finish line. What is he able to do? He does. He actually wow. bumps Ed Meadows and goes to a 144.9 for Ronnie Solomon. So he will start seventh, uh, bumping Eric Meadows down to eighth, and then obviously Emil Tab and Kristoff with no completing a lap. Well, that was an interesting session for sure. I think we learned a lot about to the track conditions out there today. Uh, Ryan Kristoff and Emil Tab both having offs. Tab's down in turn one. Kristoff over in turn number seven, locked up the rear tires. Now, if Kristoff has that 
brake bias. He might want to think for maybe later for race number three, maybe crank it forward a bit. Why would you do that, Tom? Because if you put more front bias in the car, you, you're using more front brake, you're going to extend your braking distance. The car will not brake as efficiently, but it will stabilize the car. If you have too much rear brake, it'll lock the tires up, you'll go for a bad time. So Then we uh, saw that bad we time. Saw, we yeah. saw that bad time. That, <laughs> so I know the talk in the paddock right now, other than Eric Cotille being on pole, uh, he moved up one position from yesterday's finishing order. Uh, so Eric Cotille, provisional pole sitter for race number three. Ryan Upham with a big move up to second place. Aaron Lichty kind of maintains position at third place. Woody Hyman, uh, those two just kind of swap spots uh, between the two. Uh, and then on down as we've lost timing and scoring we're headed back into time attack action but the talk of the paddock is going to be the track conditions those guys are all going to go spread the word about how tricky that was and then we're going to throw 50 cars out there and let everybody figure it out that was grid life touring cup top 10 shootout we'll return with time attack in a moment